Live from San Francisco, California, extracting the signal from the noise, it's theCUBE, covering DockerCon 2015. Brought to you by SiliconANGLE Media, with special thanks to Docker. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Hi, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We are live from San Francisco, DockerCon 2015. Uh, it's the second San Francisco DockerCon, I think the third show overall, so we've been here for two days, live coverage on theCUBE, really getting out, talking to the folks, uh, giving you a vibe for what's going on, and like we always love to do, we like to get the practitioners, not the people building the technology all the time or selling the technology, but the ones actually implementing it to make a change in their business. So we're psyched in this next segment, we have Steve Hoffman and also Rick Fast, both uh, senior principal engineers from Orbit. So gentlemen, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, thanks. Yeah, so uh, we were talking a little bit before we got stoned, before we got started, blah, 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 two days, we've been going hard. Uh, you had a session yesterday. Give us a little background for the folks that didn't make the session. What were you guys talking about? Um, so we were talking about our uh, implementation of our microservices architecture. Um, it was sort of a, one of the more successful DevOps attempts that we've, we've tried in, in recent memory. Um, and you know, Docker was kind of at the, at the, at the crux of it. And hopefully it went better than the, the some of the Docker demos on day one, didn't uh, <laughs> they? Yeah, had, did, they had the demo gods demo. Uh, got them. We've had some bad ones within orbits. So uh, talk sure. so talk about what what you're doing with Docker. How is it changing the way that you guys implement microservices? How is it kind of a game changer, and why are you you know investing in it? Um, it's 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 really enabled uh, handing over more control to the developer of their environment. You know, historically it's always been the developers would write the code and operations would deploy the code. They'd also prep the environment and Docker kind of eliminates that barrier. They now provide the code running in an environment and all we have to do is sort of deal with things like capacity and infrastructure and things like that. And if they want to go do something or try something or a new operating system, a new version of Java, whatever, we just, they just do it in Docker and we don't really have to be too worried about it. It's also kind of like trivialized the whole idea of a release or a deployment for us uh, because there's only one way to do it uh, to, regardless of what's inside the application. So, right, right. Uh, it's kind of let us focus on more interesting architectural and kind of uh, operational problems uh, as well as letting us just like the developers just worry about the code. Right. And is it changing their actual behavior, freeing them of, of, of the burden of some of the stuff that they probably didn't really want to deal with or didn't really feel it was core to their productivity? It is. Um, so Docker is just one piece, uh, and it is kind of the, the middle of everything, but uh, a lot of a lot of what we've done is taken 15 or 15 years? Yeah, 15, 15 years. 15 years of process that's been built up and up and up that's made delivering for us more difficult. I mean, it's had there's been good things that have come out of it, but ultimately, you know, we took Docker and we also kind of took the whole the whole process and said let's let's get the people out and you know streamline it so that developers don't have to worry about getting approvals to go to production and developers don't have to worry about you know all the paperwork and red tape type stuff. They really they literally just make the change, make the pull request, and let it go. Yeah, interesting. We had Michael on from Lyft yesterday, and, and he was talking about you know they can have a, a, a new person show up at work on Monday morning. You know, have their laptop to them. You know, by 9:30 or 10, a, a little introduction, take you out to the new employee lunch, <laughs> and they are at, working at one, and they're expected to push something into production by the end of the first day. That was fascinating to me. Yeah, yeah, we're not quite there yet. Uh, this is still kind of a new, still kind of a new experiment. Right. Uh, but so far, it's looking very promising, and a lot of the, a lot of the uh, teams that we've shown what what we've done are, are very interested in, in, in trying it themselves. Right, right, right. And Orbis is an interesting company because you guys were a really early adopter back in the day of, of you know, web technology, self-service, you know, people booking their own travel, very disruptive, coming out of uh, American Airlines, right, if I recall? Uh, Delta United, Northwestern, and Continental. Okay, yeah. the yeah. only one I didn't, oh, oh, everyone <laughs> but American. So, but, but. No, American was in there. Oh, they were in there, oh, they okay, were. good. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I thought American was in there. But anyway, but, so it was super new, super innovative, but now, you know, compared to like a Lyft or an Uber who really starting with, with Greenfield, you guys have, how long has it been? 15 years of, yeah, of legacy years. stuff built up. At the same time, the, the rate of change has only accelerated, the, the crazy growth in, in mobile, 
So talk about um, kind of how you guys look at kind of new technologies and new application development opportunities. At the same time, you do have uh, your own legacy stuff in place. How are you kind of managing this? Yeah, we're, uh, Orbitz for a long time has not really been afraid of new technologies. Uh, you know, some people would, some people would probably argue that um, sometimes we jump on them too quickly, uh, <laughs> for you know, even before we should. But uh, if it if it if it fills a, a gap or you know, solves two problems, you know, solves problems, then it, it's certainly on the table to consider. Um, you know the. Yeah, it's <laughs> sorry. You just take it all, right? Yeah, it was, but even but even, if, even if you think it makes sense, there's still there's so much stuff from from a, a technology uh, implementation point of view. We just think, oh my gosh, if you're sitting on that side of the table, you've got you know this this rampant explosion in, in cloud as a, as a new right. mechanism beyond test dev and into production. You've got shadow IT for people kind of doing their own thing, which it sounds like this kind of helps a little bit. You've got the you know crazy mobility. Um, and the expected behavior of applications now on the mobile. And then, oh, by the way, this little thing, big data, which you guys were probably well ahead of the curve with, with the kind of information that you've been tracking for, for 15 years, both in user behavior in the application as well as travel, et cetera, et cetera. So yep. when you're just facing this, I always tell people, it's like driving at night in a snowstorm with your headlights on. You know, it's like <laughs> everything's right. just coming out your windshield. How are you picking, how are you choosing, how are you prioritizing? So Especially with the rate of all this stuff's going. Like, right. I mean, when we started doing this stuff, so much stuff has changed, and we haven't bought into one full ecosystem yet and all the stuff that we've been building, so we've been piecing things together, Docker, Mesos, uh, Jenkins, Ansible, even Chef for uh, provisioning. Um, we've kind of pieced together something that works great for us, but is also every bit is replaceable. And the thing is, when you come to these conferences, there's so much stuff that they're talking about that's trying to bring it all together, but everything's changing so fast that there's no best practices yet. Right. And so the best thing we can do using all these newer technologies is make sure we're using them in a way that once there's kind of a better practice, that we can adopt it quickly. Right, right. And also all the buzz is usually, you know, kind of precedes maybe production ready or precedes, as you said, documentation and support and all these other things uh, as, as, as the buzz is just huge, right? And right. just continues to accelerate. Um, and then do you have like a advanced technology task force or something where you can go kind of put them in the corner and, and noodle with them a little bit yeah. before you let them out of there, the cage? There's really no pedestal <laughs> of, uh, you know, like architects that sort of command from on high. I mean, the, the, uh, we have a I mean, basically everybody that's worked there is a really good developer, and we don't necessarily want to tell them what to do. Right, right. Um, we just need to make sure that the things that we need, right, like, for instance, every every change in production needs a change ticket. It turns out that that, the, that 15 years of process, everybody thought that change ticket meant a, a, an approval from a person, and it turns out that no, only in certain circumstances do you actually need person to approve it, in most cases, for instance, the project that Rick was experimenting with, it didn't require it. And so we were able to take something that was very manual and just turn it into something that was automatic and 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 that was that. Right. The bottleneck wasn't real. The <laughs> bottleneck wasn't real. We just had to ask the it question. Was presumed, it, was, right. it was just historical. Right. Nobody right. asked thought to think of. Uh, now is that because of the development process has changed with kind of this whole DevOps cultures where the, the lines have really broken down between those that build and those that deploy? Absolutely. Yeah, we and, and we want that to break down, right? right? Because at, at the end of the day, the person that wrote the code is the best person to know when it's working and when it's not working and to troubleshoot it. Right. Uh, but, you know, and so part of our job is to get out of the way and try and provide them the tools and the infrastructure so that you know they can they can do things more quickly, changes, to try things out, um, troubleshoot, uh, and then if they want to deploy in the middle of the day and they're fairly confident with it, we let them do it. And if it breaks, they're standing right there to take care of it. Right. And right. it turns out when you give when you give the ownership to the developers, they usually do a better job anyway, um, for the fact that they actually own it. Right. 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 So they wrote it. They, right. they know it best. Even though they don't get beepers anymore, right, to go off at four in the morning. <laughs> so so you've really seen the, the, the benefits of the DevOps culture. You've seen the really the benefits of, of pushing that operational piece back to the to the guys that actually write and deploy the code. 
Yeah, we. I, I would say the number of developers versus operations people, it's probably a factor of, I don't know, 10 or 20 to 1. Right. And so it, we don't want to, the operations people do not want to be that bottleneck, right? We just want to get them what they need as quick as we can so that they can do what they need to do. Right, right. So talk a little bit about DockerCon. Again, you guys were here, you presented, you know, how long have you been involved with, with Docker? Are you guys contributing at all to, to, the, uh, to the project? Or are you just purely uh, consumers and excited that it's going to potentially change your, change your world back at the office? Uh, at this point, we're more consumers than contributors. Uh, we're probably pretty close to maybe jumping on the contributor bandwagon. Okay. Um, We've contributed on a few pieces that not directly Docker, but right. kind of in this whole ecosystem. Okay. Um, so, uh, like our service discovery, we use console, so we've contributed heavily uh, to console. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we've contributed some stuff for like for uh, deployments on uh, Jenkins with Mesos. Uh, we've contributed a little bit there, um, right. but nothing directly to Docker. Okay. But. Yeah, I've got, I've got something that I've been working on that I'm looking to open source. That's kind of like one of these bridge things where you're not all in on Docker. You have to use you know kind of what you have now, but it lets you. Get going there. Okay. I don't know. We'll we'll see. Any time? Any, uh, any any ship date uh, ready to go? Uh, yeah. It's it's just a matter of uh, you know putting in a form that's <laughs> consumable. <Send. laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know you got to write up the documentation right, and right. Um, examples and. Well, we've been working with Docker probably since about this time last year. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We were yeah we were here last year at the conference and when they announced Docker Hub and you know uh, Swarm was like not even a thing yet. Um, and that was why we kind of went down the Mesos route because that was kind of the most advanced thing. And now it's nice to see that there's this, you know, open container alliance going on right, and right. Uh, more standardization. And that's that's just going to help everybody. And is that good run. for you? I mean, were you excited with that announcement? Is that you know, kind of you talked about putting in stuff that you can swap right. out later if you have to. Exactly. But that said, you know, does it feel good to have you know, some level of standardization on some portion of the total? Uh, that you can then build off or have a, l a little, I guess, higher confidence level, maybe yeah. that it's going to last longer. I feel less locked in at this point. Um, I mean, I think we're all in on containers, but like the fact that they did, you know, announce that yesterday, that definitely, you know, yeah. makes me feel better because, like I said, I mean, I walk down this hallway, talk to these vendors, and there's so much new stuff, and it just keeps changing so fast. And I'm like, oh God, we need to get rid of this thing we're doing, and you know, swap this. It's, yeah. uh, you know, I've, like, it's it changes so fast, and like. I've, I'm already thinking of things that I want to jettison and swap out for things that I've learned in yeah. the past two days. And and Orbitz has been a big user of open source technology like right. since the beginning. Right. Right. And, and you just it's 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 good to know that um, we're going to have all that interoperability and things are going to be pluggable and it's not just you know you 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 do it our way or or you don't do it right of, right because that never that never sits well and um, you know you always want. You know, the technologies that are going to win in open source are the ones that are just better. Right. Right. Um, if everybody's playing by the same rules and company A does it better than company B, then company A is going to win and company B has got to step up their game and make it better and that's how good stuff gets made. Right. Talk, just dig in a little deeper about open source. You know, open source, both as a consumer of open source, and you do have this, you know, things get forked funny and... You know, then there's the support, and you know, what, where do you play? But also in terms of within your own developer community, you know, there's a lot of goodness that comes to people who are contributing to open source, right? There's a lot of, you know, kind of juju in the marketplace or feeling good. There's a lot of, of peer, uh, peer feel good. Is, where does open source play for Orbitz? You know, is it just as a cons as a to consume it, or how does it really impact your kind of culture of development? So definitely as a consumer. Um, We've made a lot of, uh, Orbitz has made a lot of contribu contributions to open source. So Graphite was originally developed at Orbitz, which is still probably, I would say, one of the most heavily used uh, monitoring uh, visualization uh, services out there, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, we're contributing uh, for console right now. Uh, we have lots of other, you know, older uh, uh, libraries that are still in S somewhat use. They're in use. Oh. Yeah, there's a, there's a few like like for instance Irma, the Irma, which was a monitoring framework. It, it 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 never really caught on as much as some of the other projects like Graphite. But you know the the you know the the con the idea of contributing back. Um, you know it's not 
it's not in Orbitz's business interest to like write a web server. We want right. to use an open source one, right? Right. Um, right. We want to focus on the things that make Orbitz Orbitz and right. selling travel and getting you know people matched up with you know so that we're sticking in front of them the things that they're actually looking for. Right. So they get to go where they want. We get we get the transaction. We get the transaction right. and right and things like writing a web server or writing you know a, a key store or things like that. It's just it's it's not a competitive advantage, and so uh, using open source and contributing back to open source, it, it just it, it helps everybody. Right, right. So let's talk about your business a little bit. Or like I say, Orbit's been around for a long time, fifteen years. Right, start out. I just need to book. I need to book a flight, and I'm not going down to the lady at the at the corner anymore. <laughs> right. Um, but it's a very competitive space. You guys have been at it for a long time. Travel in general is a competitive industry. So, what kind of cool stuff are you guys working on? What, where, how are you using all these technologies, big data, to really not so much build a competitive advantage, which is great, but to continue to enhance the experience of the person interacting uh, with your application? So, uh, so we're doing a lot of cool stuff. Um, uh, one of the projects that's kind of in flight right now is uh, uh, we. Uh, we have a culture of uh, experimentation on our website, and uh, so at any given moment, there's hundreds of what we A/B tests running okay. on orbits at any given time. And the goal is to well improve conversion, but also improve the user experience and you know make the website easier to use. Right. Right. And so we run these experiments, and you know typically in the past few years we run them and then we let them run for a long time, and then we go in and say, you know, we run a bunch of, you know, uh, BI, you know, big data, long running queries to figure out, you know, what we're how good. we did. Right. Um, and so, but we want to scale up to the point where almost every feature we, especially that is close to the front end, starts off as an experiment. And we want to be able to, you know, find out if they're tanking conversion or improving it faster so that we can actually have more experiments running at the same time. Uh, so. A lot of the stuff we've been doing with the microservices in-house, um, we're actually using a lot of some of that platform in Amazon to actually process uh, the user data as they as they traverse through the, the funnel on our website, uh, and actually process that data and be able to run uh, analysis on it in real time. Okay. And so, if we if we deploy a A/B test on the website that's tanking in five minutes, we'll know about it, uh, and if it's Vastly improving, you know, progression through the website or conversion faster. Um, we'll know about that way faster than way we did before, right? And quicker. So, do you guys use Hadoop? Uh, we do. We do. You do. You plan? Did you go to Spark Summit last week? Uh, we had a couple guys that did go. We did not go. Okay. Yeah. We were there. It's just you know, it's a, it's it's just a crazy time. I mean, there's just so much development. Things are moving so fast. Mm -hmm. So we're getting the hook. I give you the last word. As the uh, as the trucks pack up tonight, we pack up all the stuff, and, and the uh, we're pulling away here from the Marriott. What's the bumper sticker for DockerCon 2015? Hmm. It's, I stumped them. It's going to be a fun year. Yeah, it's going to be fun to see what what's coming out. I, I'm very excited about um, the the some of the new stuff in the security. Um, you know, one of the one of the um, one of the problems with Docker, with the sort of immutable images, has always been, you know, how do you like pass secrets in, like database keys and things like that. And there's really not a good solution for that right now. People just kind of jerry rig something together. And it's nice to see that um, Docker and other people, are, uh, these other companies, are all working together to come up with like really good solutions and not just hacks. Right. Right. A um, lot of our pain points have been addressed. I, I would say by the things that they've been announcing yeah. this time, and not just Docker, the other vendors and stuff too. Right, like, right, right. And it's know. either like ready to go or almost ready to go, and so uh, it's going to be a it's going to be a fun year. It's a good one, and that was pretty quick. I mean, it's only a couple of years, right, that this yeah. thing's been going on. So the fact yeah. that they're rapidly addressing your concerns is either they're really yeah. lucky, they're really listening, or I guess you fit in the middle of the bell curve somewhere. Well, they're I mean they're they're onto something, yeah. right? I mean the, clearly. I mean the conference went from what. 500, 500 last year to 2000, year to 2000 year. yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're scratching an itch that <laughs> needs scratching. Great. Well, Steve, Rick from Orbitz, thanks for stopping by, sharing some of the insight. Like I said, we'd love to get the pra practitioner point of view. Um, I'm Jeff Frick, you're watching theCUBE. We're at DockerCon 2015 in downtown San Francisco. We'll be back with our next guest after this short break. Thanks for watching.